Hey there everyone. Day 29 of this blog as we continue to discover and wrestle with what it means to be the community of God's people, the church, while our temple space is temporarily unavailable to us, and to dig into God's word and promises and watch as it shapes us and forms us as his people around our table spaces to have the character and competencies of Jesus. We're continuing our conversation about making room for people in our lives, um, hospitality, and how that leads towards deeper and stronger relationships uh, where the gospel can take root. Today we're looking at making room for the self-righteous. Um, if you've got your He Reads Truth or She Reads Truth app handy, um, this is day four in that reading series. But if not, here are the references we're looking at. Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Matthew 23, 37 through 39, Luke 15, 11 through 32, Luke 18, 9 through 14, Romans 2, 1 through 11, and Romans 3, 9 through 23. So again, a lot of references there. Uh, I'll link them in the description below so you can look them up if you need to. But if you're looking for one that I'm going to be looking at specifically, I'm looking at Romans 3, 9 through 23. Now, many people have noted very quickly, or, or, or very rightly, that Romans is uh, one of the, the, the strongest pieces of doctrine that Paul ever wrote, and he wrote it to the, the, the Christians in Rome, and, and really to the church universally, as a, a kind of a manifesto of, of Christian doctrine and what we should believe. And it's pretty dense. There are a lot of things that we could spend a lot of time on here, but in particular, I'm looking at verse 19 and following which I'll read right now. And this, in many ways, if we talk about making room for self-righteous people in our lives, I think the first thing we have to do is kind of point the finger at ourselves and say, yeah, that's me. I can be self-righteous. I can be judgmental to people around me. And I need to have the posture of knowing that I'm in need of forgiveness and love and care from a God who doesn't um, wash his hands of me if I make a mistake. And that I can um, similarly be gracious to those around me. And there has to be that level playing field. So that's what Paul does here. Romans 3, 19 and following. He says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are subject to the law, so that every mouth may be shut and the whole world may be become subject to God's judgment. Because God is sovereign. He's the one who tells us who we are and makes that judgment. Nobody else can judge us the way that God can. And we can thank God for that because as humans, we judge each other improperly sometimes. Actually, I would say most of the time. For um, 20, for no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. So that's the bad news. The law judges us. Here's the standard. You're not making the cut. And we do that before God, and we also do it before one another. So here's the good news on the other side of that, verse 21 and 22. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and prophets. And what does it look like? It looks like Jesus. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. There's no distinction about who's failed and who's made the cut. Um, Jew or Greek, Gentile or uh, solid Jewish worshiper, we're all on the same playing field. We are all, um, all sinners at the foot of the cross in need of God's forgiveness and love, and he gives it in abundance. And I think when we have that kind of level playing field, it makes it much easier to um, welcome others into our lives, especially those who don't quite seem to get it yet that we're all in need of forgiveness. I love, uh, in, in the devotion that goes along with this, the quote from G.K. Chesterton, where a, a bunch of different experts were asked, what's wrong with the world? And Chesterton's uh, answer was very simple, I am. Wow. What, what great uh, self-awareness to say. It'd be easy to point the finger at anyone or anything, any societal difficulty, and say, that's the problem. But when I'm honest with myself, here's where the problem starts. And if I can start letting God um, work on me and mess with me and shape me into a person who looks more like him, that's going to be a lot more good for the world than if I tried to make big sweeping changes before cleaning my own room, so to speak. 
So there's just a few thoughts about that. Um, once again, to getting into um, this book for today, I finished up with uh, with uh, joining Jesus. And if you haven't read this already, or if you, I, I would encourage you to reread it if you've read it, because there's so much um, good and practical um, insight into this as to how to be the church nowadays, and especially as we look about com look at coming out of quarantine and being neighborly to one another. I think that that's going to be a really helpful and healthy thing. Um, so. It's continue to dig into that, chew on that, digest it, inwardly digest it, as the scriptures say, um, because I think there's a lot of truth in what what it means to practically be the church in this day and age. But for, for the time being, we're moving on to Adorning the Dark by Andrew Peterson. And um, the first chapter is entitled Box Secret Weapon. Once again, this is just a few of my musings as I continue to challenge myself to, to um, read through a book and stay, stick with a chapter a day. Sometimes that's a, a, a tricky thing for me, even as much as I love books and I, I, a full-fledged bibliophile. Um, but I'm actually just kind of using this as an opportunity to stay on track and inviting you to hear a few of my thoughts each day. So... Um, Peterson's general idea here, it's the subtitle of the book is Thoughts on Community, Calling in the Mystery of Making. What does it mean to be a an artist or a creator, uh, someone who works at their craft in some sort of significant way? And I think that applies to all of us to a certain degree. And uh, he's kind of giving some insight, some personal insight into his own process of writing songs and uh, and writing books, which is kind of his, his niche. But it also is applicable to all of us. And this is what I like about this. On um, page two of, of, uh, of the book, uh, he, he brings up a, a passage that we've actually talked about in the Joining Jesus conversation recently. Uh, Here's what I know in a nutshell, he says. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Matthew 6, 33. Sounds like one of the, the five missional practices, right? Number one, seek the kingdom first and everything else falls into place. And that's kind of what he says here. Early on, I didn't always seek God's kingdom first. And Lord knows his, king, his righteousness was only on my mind for a minute or two a day max. And in parentheses, he says, I think I'm up to three, maybe four minutes now. I can resonate with that. That simple scripture draws into sharp focus the only thing that will satisfy us in our desperate seeking for what it is that we think we want. We may want something harmless, but if it's out of place, if it comes before the right thing, then what's benign becomes malignant. We want the wrong thing. And so he goes on a little bit later about kind of clearing all that clutter away and saying, seek the kingdom first and everything else falls into place. Whether you're going to create a, a song or a novel or simply um, be about the restorative mission of God in a, another way. That's all I got for you for today. So for the time being, stay connected to God's word. Stay connected to his solid truths. Um, be well. Look out for your neighbors and those around you. And I will see you tomorrow. God's peace to you. Pastor, out.